B-B-O-T. Well, good morning, everybody. Oh, come on. It's day two. We're all friends now. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. We're TV people, for heaven's sakes. This is fun. So, what we're going to do is talk about design and the future of design. But to kick things off, I want to kind of do a little introduction. Who in the audience is a designer? Okay, we don't have a lot of designers. Who in the audience knows a designer or works with a designer? Okay, who in the audience is really scared of designers? There we go, right back there. All right. The idea about the panel today is to talk about the future of design. So not so much talk about what's going on today, but where things are going. And so as Tracy said, I'm Brian David Johnson. I'm a futurist at the uh, Intel Corporation. And I um, kind of have a varied background. I, on one hand, I'm a principal engineer. So I think in software stacks and network architectures. And then I was also a designer a long, long time ago. I was a designer back when I had hair. So it's been a very long time since I've been a designer. Um, but as Tracy said, um, I'm a futurist and I wrote this book called Screen Future, which if you haven't got a copy yet, there's copies outside. The publisher's been so good to actually support Tracy and actually give away copies of this. And also, um, was talking with Tracy and the team after this, during the break, I guess we're going to do a little impromptu signing. So I'll be out by the registration desk if you want to get a new copy or you want to get your copy signed, just swing on by and, and I'll sign it. And then also as a, a quick little kind of side plug, there's another bit of work that I do. We did a panel yesterday about this, about science fiction based on science fact. And that's what this is, which you can also get a copy of. It's called The Tomorrow Project. And it's really getting people to talk about the future and talk about um, the future that we all want to live in, um, but using science fiction based on science fact to have that conversation. And then there's also this little pamphlet, which is uh, a new book that actually has just come out that I wrote. Uh, from Morgan and Claypool, and they've been so good to support Tracy, and actually, um, you can download a free copy of it um, for a limited time. Okay, so that's all the housekeeping. So science fiction and prototyping. Oh yeah, science fiction and prototyping, designing the future with science fiction. Okay, so, as I said, the, the idea of this was to talk... <laughs> so, as a part of my work as a futurist, what I do is I go around the world and talk to people um, about uh, where they think the future of design is going. And if uh, any of you, I wrote a column with Tracy called Jet Set for a while, which kind of sort of chronicled those conversations. And I wanted to kind of kick this off and tell you a quick story about a recent um, experience I had in Mumbai, India. So I figured, right, Mumbai, right, it's one of the movie capitals and entertainment capitals of the world. So I went to Mumbai to kind of learn what they thought was the future of entertainment. And so I went there and I told them I wanted to go and be on a set, but not a really, really nice set, like a set that was doing TV work that was just cranking it out. And so if anybody's been to Mumbai, it takes about two to three hours to get anywhere in Mumbai uh, because the traffic is so bad because there's so many people. And so we're sort of set in this cab and they're kind of trundling me around and we get to this set and it, it looks a bit like a set um, that you would have in the United States. There's a lot more people, so it's kind of Bollywood style. So there's people everywhere. Um, and you have sort of people running around doing work and then you have people, you have women in gorgeous sort of traditional Hindi outfits just sort of lounging back working on their phones or working on their iPads. And it, it starts to get kind of strange when you see all these people, and it's, but it's a set, right? And so I wanted to talk to the people who were directing it and producing it. And so they kind of bring me in and take me backstage. And again, it wasn't really planned for me to be there, but they, I kind of pushed really hard that I wanted to see an actual living, breathing set. So they took me along the back, and I went back along where all the feeder cables were and where they had all the... Um, guys kind of making lunch in the background. And they took me in and then set me down in the studio audience. And then the guy who was my translator sort of started looking around and said, I think there's a mistake. I think they thought you wanted to be in the studio audience and not actually go backstage. So he goes, wait right here, I'll be right back. And he runs away. 
this is a, around the point which I find myself in these situations because I travel a whole bunch where I go, holy crap. I don't speak Hindi. I'm by myself in Mumbai. I look like this in a suit surrounded by all these folks who are super into this sort of comedy game show. And I realize I'm stuck. I have no idea where I am, how to get away, who to talk to, what to do. So I just sort of give myself over to the whole experience. And there's, there's stuff going on. The, the set is amazing. The set has like eight foot high horse heads and like eight foot high elephant heads. And there's clowns carved into the, clowns carved into the walls. And there's basically people in like glitter dancing around. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So I sit there after about 15 minutes. My translator comes back and goes, okay, we found the director. They take me back out, they take me around the back, and they literally take me through a hole in the wall. And it's about that high, and all the cables are running into this hole in the wall. And so I walk, literally, you sort of step inside, and it would, it, honestly, it would be um, sort of questionable if it were, if a sort of OSHA would allow this to happen in the US. But it was cool, and I was getting in there, and you went inside this really dark room. And then I realized I was standing in one of the most modern control rooms I had ever been in. So there was a huge bank of monitors. They had, I think, 24 automated cameras set up that had the sound mixing board, um, and they were going to beat the band. This thing was going to be on the next day. It was going to air. So I get back there, I'm talking to my translator, and the, and the director and the producer say that they know a little bit of English, so I tell them what I do, and I tell them about a futurist, being a futurist, and screen future, and all the stuff that I do. And so I really want to know what you think the future of TV is. I said, in the future of entertainment, I said, you guys can make TV like nobody else. So what is the future of TV? And the guy kind of looks at me and does this. And then he points over at the laptop that they're doing the sound mixing on. And then he points at the TV. And he goes, it's just about screens. Which, for me, of course, I was on this quest to find out that they were going to tell me the secret. And it actually turned out it's what we've all been talking about. It's the thing that we've been talking about and actually that Tracy and, and all of us sort of in this injury have been sort of talking about and thinking about. And so as, I wanted to tell you that as background because what I wanted to do in this panel is not violently agree with each other. To basically say from a design standpoint, if we're going to design for this screen future, what does that mean? What do we have to do? And that's what we're going to do today. We have a few examples, but mainly we're actually going to have an honest to goodness conversation here on stage. And I have to tell you that the folks um, who have agreed to be on this panel, who I've had them waiting backstage, um, you've got to be really nice to them because I've been awful to them. I have not told them anything what we're going to talk about today at all. Because I actually want to have a real conversation on stage about what we might be able to do. They've done some great work. Um, and we're going to use that as sort of a jumping off point, but we're actually just going to have a conversation about where things could go, and we're going to do it on stage. So again, please be nice to them and welcome them out. So Gavin, Rebecca, Dewey, Margaret, can you please come out? Have a round of applause for them. <laughs> Notice how they're walking very slowly and hesitantly. Hi guys, how's it going? So what we'll do is we're going to start with real quick introductions and I've told them I want to keep that relatively short. Again, they're all here and have been picked because they're doing really incredible cutting edge work. Um, and we're going to use their work as a jumping off point. But if you want to know more about them, it's called the internet. Look them up. I mean, they're doing really, really great work. But we want to spend this time, especially in front of you, having a design conversation. But I want to give them all a chance just to introduce themselves. So. Rebecca, we'll start with you and we'll just go on down the line. Okay. Good morning. I'm Rebecca Resklim. I'm a senior director at Stars Entertainment in the Internet and the Interactive Development Group. And um, I love this show. I really appreciate you guys are all here. I think Tracy's the bomb, even though she told me not to say that. And uh, we're going to talk about design today. My name is Gavin Kelly. I'm one of the two principals at Artifact. We're a product design consultancy in uh, Seattle. I didn't realize when I 
joined the panel that an absence of hair was going to be one of the criteria, and I was going to be on the bold guy panel. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Margaret Schmidt. I'm Vice President of User Experience at TiVo, which means I'm responsible for the UI design across the DVR, TV, PC, Mac, mobile, and web. And I've been at TiVo for 10 years, and background is design, design, design. There are a lot of people here who are scared of you, just so you know. I'm Dewey Reed, and um, I have a small company called ETV. It's Entertainment Advertising Technology Television. Um, I'm actually about to make a move to Yahoo and running their innovations team in design. So that's the next thing I'm going to be doing. Great. Thanks, guys. So I think, again, as we talked about, what we want to do is we're going to start talking about some of the work that you've done, but use that as a sort of launching off point to say, you know, here's what we, you've kind of done, but not so much about sort of, you know, getting too deep into that, but talking about what would you want to do next and sort of, sort of the questions and the issues behind how do we design for these screens, right? And because I think for all of us agree, we really need less talking and more building. We need more design now because we have the capability. So why don't we, uh, Rebecca, start with yours. Okay, do you have the one that was before that? The, also the being, as being a futurist, I can tell you that things will go wrong with this. So I was just going to talk about, if you have the other one, I was going to talk about a little bit about our eBIF application. And I know if you were here last year, I did a demo of this, and our eBIF app has evolved. It's on its third generation now. The one that's on screen right now is our newest one. Um, we change the branding a lot, but the bottom line is um, we simplified. We, if you're working as a designer in eBIF, you know that for the legacy set-top boxes, you basically have 14 colors to work with because black and white you can do, but they're, you know, it is what it is. On the higher-end boxes, you can use more, but we've built this app like an ATM, right? So you get in there, you get that trigger, which is the more options, click OK. You click OK, and then this overlay comes up. So the start again basically goes straight off and makes a VOD call and goes to that same title on On Demand. Um, we're really um, trying to make this really simple from on air um, to on demand in one click, which in some of the guides today would take um, seven clicks. So that's kind of where we are right now. This is about to go, well, it is in the field. Uh, big test right now. We're pretty excited. It took two years to get there. But from a design perspective, it's like simple, simple, simple. And um, I've got another example later of the other one. Um, but I, I just think, you know, from a design perspective, even we're just trying to use um, the interactivity that we can get out of eBIF to really just make the consumer experience better as a premium channel. So I'll stop there. Right, so, Rebecca, let me ask you this. So, what would you do next steps with this project if? you had, if you didn't have the same technical constraints. If you wanted to get this, oh, there we yeah, go, now those it's are the old, Yeah, that's. So cool. if you wanted to get this working on multiple screens, what sort of, what experience would you design? What would you like to do? Well, I mean, for, um, that's, uh, this is where we're going, right? This is one that we've just launched. Um, this uh, in January. So this is kind of the holy grail to be able to do upsell on screen. And once somebody pushes, a viewer pushes that C button, the conversion rates on it are really high. So we're able to, you don't have stars, instead of going and getting basically an error screen from the guide, you do an opt-in and you get a screen like this where the video automatically starts to play. Um, with about stars and then the special offers that we have and we can count what people are actually clicking on so we can modify what we're doing um, but big dumb buttons basically right it's a TV we don't want to overdo it we just want to have people get in get their content and get out and, and not you know make it harder than it has to be okay how about now that this is working we'll move to Dewey uh, this is a project that we um, just began this year. Um, a company um, that's up in Seattle um, bought huge libraries of historic material. And um, they kind of just put it up online and they wanted to do something with it. So what we did is we created uh, a magazine out of these assets. And it's called Memory Lane Magazine. But what it, what it basically does is it takes you down to levels 
down below that um, tell stories about the past. Everything's kind of hooked to the present, but it also tells stories about the past. And we, we built players in this thing that do slideshows, show video, and we also have all the audio that goes along with it too. So this is, when I designed this thing, we really, I wanted to design it for TV. Even though this is on the web, this will go for TV. And one of the challenges that we always try to take care of is, you know, what is the, you know, what, what is this input device going to be? So I always try to de design for all input devices, well, no matter what I design and no matter where I'm designing. So that's basically it. Do you have uh, any of the other ones? Yeah, this, this is another cover. Um, we're actually on the third cover now. It's a really exciting project because all this stuff, you, you know, these are all stills, but actually these are video footage loops, and there's a lot of animation going on in the front cover of this thing. So it's super rich in media and, uh, and, and really fun. I mean, that was our whole point. How do we make it as much fun for people as possible? But we got a great writer on this and a really small team of people. And that's the thing that I really like about design nowadays is that the fact that with a very small team of people, you can do some amazing things. I mean, amazing stuff. So how would you take this to these different screens? So this is on the <clears throat> web now, and you mentioned that you'd take it to TV because right. this would translate to TV. What does this look like on a tablet, and what does it look like on a, on a smartphone? Well, Theoretically. Here's, a, here's, a, here's the funny thing is when we, we built the prototype in HTML5, which is incidentally a, a great prototyping platform. I mean, it's super. Uh, to go across all browsers, we actually had to go back in time and rebuild it in Flash, which is just like drives me crazy. But at any rate, we already had it on a tablet. It was already functioning on a tablet. And it was really great because, I mean, you know, there's a lot of 3D that's going on in here. When you hit and go into another section, there's these big 3D transitions that go on. So we really did, when we designed the thing and prototyped it, we, we designed it for um, you know, all platforms, for tablets, for TV, and for PC. So if you could take this to the next step, if you could take this so people were carrying it in their pocket and walking around with it, if you, have, if you were unbounded by money and time, <laughs> imagine that, what would you do? And what I, would I, do? I, I, can, I can put it to everybody else. We, we, we can yeah, poach what, your design what would as I well. do? What would I do differently or? Well, how would you evolve it? Like what would be the next step? Again, as we begin to design for these multiple screens, how would you think about, about doing it? I mean, one of the things that, I, that we've begun to see and that I've talked to people is that this idea that once you put an, something like this, say, on a smartphone, right. and the smartphone knows where you are, that you can have a dramatically different experience than you would have, say, Absolutely. with the content. Same content, but you could have a different experience with that content because you know, you're, being, you're able to kind of pull things up, pull up shopping, and also you have different opportunities for commerce as well. Right. Well, I mean, we built a lot of commerce models into this thing um, because we, we call them uh, media marks instead of bookmarks. So as the story is being told, there's little thumbnails that are showing up that you can click on and then go. But I mean, if it was in a mobile sort of environment, yes. I mean, it would be great to say, you know, when you're at the ballpark to say, hey, this is where, this, this is where Mickey Mantle played, you know, or things like that. I mean, it would be great to do that. Um, as far as pushing it further, um, you know, just more rich interactivity and more full screen stuff. I mean, right now I'm, I'm kind of limited by players and different things, you know, different tools like that. Uh, you know, I'd really like to see the thing, you know, advance in the, in the way of just, it's, it's so easy to run and so, and so beautiful. I mean, that's the biggest thing that we've got going for us now is that we've got these great screens that we can deal with right now. It's also the problem because of the different sizes they are. Right, right. So, um, Margaret, we were talking before that, that you, you have an iPad app. As you begin to sort of take the TiVo experience and again, march it across all of these different screens, because I know there's things you can't tell us, but as you take it to this next screen, which is, well, it's actually, you're also on laptops and, and PCs as well. What have been the challenges for you? What have you wanted to do and you've not been able to do? Sure, so the product we have today with the TiVo DVR, you can connect your uh, iPad app to that DVR so it can control it. And it's safe to assume there will be other tablet and phone platforms. And it knows what you're watching on the TV. Whether it's live or recorded, it knows the show, it knows the minute you're in. And the things we do today are, you know, who's that guest star, what is the next episode, that kind of connectivity. And in terms of what we'd like to do next, the interactive TV experience on the kind of second screen experience, the supplemental content on the iPad can be very rich. It can be associated with the minute you are in the TV show. It can be associated with the commercial that you're watching. 
And so using that platform, whether it is an app we have designed or just you know, intelligently linking from the Food Network show you're watching and the recipe they're talking about to the Food Network app on that recipe or that enhanced content, I think is a really interesting piece. So we need that mechanism where we can, um, there's enough standardization in the apps and the connectivity that we can launch the work that, all, that everyone else is doing and create that, uh, that tie between the two. And then take the enhanced web content, which is available, which you might not be wanting to watch on the iPad. TV is still, in many cases, a shared experience. And so when you put in that second screen, whether it's the phone or the um, tablet or laptop, and someone else is watching, it actually separates the people, right? So there are some things you do want to do on your own watching, but sometimes you do want to share it and be able to, to throw that content back up to the TV. Oh, this is the longer step-by-step -step, uh, recipe, or this is something related. Let's pause what I'm watching now. Let's throw this other one up on the TV and let's have that shared experience. Is uh, Those are the kinds of things we'd really like to be doing next. So what's it like working with all of those other brands? So what's it like as you beginning to craft, and again, you're dealing with sort of TV brands, and then even with those brands, you're dealing with the TV folks and the web folks yeah. and sort of all these different f people. I mean, aside from the fact that you love them dearly and love working with them, how, what's that like? Well, so we've had the most experience working with other brands on TV and designing for TV, and it is really interesting seeing very large brands who have had a strong web presence who deliver video over the web struggle when it comes to designing for TV because designing for TV and designing for web or for tablet is very different. And we've been trying to kind of coach and mentor, here, here are good design principles for TV. Please, please make your fonts readable from the couch. Um, th so wait, so you're, you're, you're tripping a little bit into the secret language of, of, of design. Yes. So, for, so for folks who aren't designers, what, mm -hmm. again, what are those struggles? I mean, I hear that a lot, right? We, we even talked yeah. a little bit about this last year, that there's font problems. I mean, even yeah. the, the font packages and the, the ID packages that get put together, um, I mean, you're, you're Gavin, you're, you're, you're nodding, so please chime in. I mean, what, I mean, there's, if we're, if we know this world of multi-screens is coming, and I think we all do, I mean, if, if you don't believe that, then you might just be new to today, but if you sat and looked at all the commerce, all the research that was going on, it's certainly coming. So if this is happening, do we feel, as designers, that you have the tools that you need, the packages and approaches that you need to develop those compelling experiences? I, th I think it's less about the tools and more about the platforms uh, and, and the technology behind those platforms. And I think the tools that we use as designers doesn't really change whether given the target uh, device. Hmm. You know, we're, we're using uh, the same software packages. And what's, what's the real struggle is the, pl is the platform itself and designing not just for legibility and not just for uh, the experience itself, but designing for things like performance. When you're designing across um, devices, you can have, so our example has a TV with a WebKit, WebKit browser, we have an iPad and we have a phone. These all have different technology behind them, and different capabilities as a chipset, and understanding the, the limitations really drives some of your design decisions. So the work that we've done, similar to Dewey, is, uh, this, uh, this is an example of a project that we did, where you're designing something three times. Uh, even with uh, something like HTML5, you have to make those considerations around form factor in that you don't just make it smaller and you don't just make it bigger. The layouts change, the navigation metaphors change. I'm getting into design speak here, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's a lot of work to design one experience across three different platforms, as it were. Uh, this is an example where there's a sort of indication of where TV might go. TV as an experience is fundamentally unchanged over the last what, 70, 80 years, that experience of watching uh, targeted uh, watching content, uh, time shifting was a, was a major innovation, thanks to TiVo, who sort of broke the ground there. What we were looking at in this project was how do you make a more personal and relevant experience? So there was a good, good panel yesterday on content awareness. So the, the TV now knows what it's showing. Uh, what we looked at is what happens if you know who is watching it? 
and this is really interesting. This is now when, when TV becomes really interesting. Uh, you know, Netflix gets kind of close to this when you, when you log in, but that's a, that's a very uh, walled system. We looked at uh, how it goes when you sign, uh, how do you authenticate in a multi-user environment? You don't want to, we decided very early on, that you don't want to have to sign in to your TV. You don't have to log in. Uh, that, that's, that's a direction we chose not to go. But the one foot, the two foot, uh, experience enables you to authenticate. So now that I can authenticate through Facebook, I can now get the materials, I can now get content that is much more relevant to me. Uh, and so my program guide gets replaced with a feed. It's much more like a Facebook, something that I'm interested in. And it also enables something else, which is discovery. Uh, with, the, with the 500 channels, you have a new problem, and that's finding what I want to watch and the chances of me finding what's, what I'm going to like are pretty, pretty slim, uh, the most powerful recommendation engine is my friends. And so sure. once I have my friends participating uh, in these systems, now I'm going to be able to discover much more relevant content. So I think, it's, I think the tools are important, but the, the platforms and, and some of the other yeah, things that's are a, that, No, that's a good point. I, I want to add one thing, and I, I can be the resident geek, right? So, so yeah. that's mine, is that, I mean, I have, I, I have seen technologies, and I've, I've written about it, I think, in, when, in Tracy's, um, in the column, where, you know, with things like Connect and, and other things, that your TV and most of your devices can actually know who's in the room and, and who's there, and do it safely and securely. I mean, I will never forget the first time I walked into one of our labs at Intel, and I walked in front of the television, and I actually saw an outline of myself, and it said BDJ. And it actually just knew me. They had used my badge as a way, and it just knew who I was. So the idea that actually just using these devices and being with these devices as a means of logging in, I think is, a, is kind of interesting, and I think affords kind of a, an interesting new design challenge of actually designing the experience. And that's kind of the next thing I want to talk to you guys about is kind of, because that's the thing as designers that you bring is this holistic experience across all of these different devices, which is essentially how this is gonna be monetized. I mean, it, it's the experience that people are gonna pay for. Granted, it's the content, but it's also the experience around the content. I just add one, one last thing on the, on the monetization. I, I think there's a lot of business people trying to find out how to monetize interactive TV, and it's all around demographics. And what if you can get so granular that you're targeting an individual? And I think we're entering into a sort of a dangerous time of uh, data and data mining and awareness and privacy concerns. But what if that message is so tailored to you as an individual, not as a demographic, not as a 20 to 35 year old male, uh, but a person who has uh, very specific uh, information around what they like, what they right. do. Right. And just one thing about the, when you identify the user in the room, don't forget that again, TV is a shared experience. People are doing different things when they're watching alone versus when they're watching with their spouse or with their family. And so it is really all the combinations of people, you need to be smart about them. So how do you design for that? How do you begin to make an experience? Whereas before, as you said, when it was just the TV, it was sort of shared in everybody. I mean, right. we all know the TiVo UI, but now as you begin to take that brand and that experience and all of the experiences of all the broadcasters and advertisers on those different devices, how do you architect that? How do you think about that? Well, we think about, so part of it is, you know, TiVo wants to be smart and provide, you know, the obvious options for you as the easiest ones. And if you start to look at, if you study the user and how when this person is alone, this is what they tend to do, and when these people are together, this is what they tend to do. I mean, you could, you could have the equivalent of the kind of Google, I'm feeling lucky, when these two people sit down to watch TV, they're most, okay, so it's Tuesday night and it's after eight o'clock, they actually watch Glee basically in real time, but time shifted, you know, they hit a button and this is what they most likely want to watch. So it's part of, you know, understanding users' past behavior, and, but modifying that for who's really watching it. So Rebecca, so as you, you have, you know, Stars is a, is a huge brand, lots of content. How do you, as you start to think about designing for those multiple screens and that experience, how do you, you and your team kind of think about that? Well, as a lot of you know, we had, we were very early into the broadband game with a product called Vongo. And, you know, a user experience that we controlled, lots of testing, 
you know, lots of research, took it across, you know, just PCs and then onto MCE Vista with, I think, one of the most rock and TV interfaces that ever lived, right? But bottom line, it never got anywhere. So, um, you know, now we have Stars Play. When we look at um, all these different platforms, okay, we have to authenticate our users, right? I mean, love HTML5, but the DRM that it supports is not necessarily one we can use. So for some of the studio contracts, et cetera. Um, so we have to kind of look, okay, do we want to build an app over here? And then when that operating system changes, then do we kill that one? Do we build another one? Which is a shiny object today? Where are people going to really, the eyeballs are going to go? So, so are, I, are you finding that the kind of the data and the DRM and sort of all of the different technical back end that feeds into these screens is helping to shape your design or shaping your design? Well, I mean, it's a showstopper if they can't log in and get to the content, right? I mean, bottom line. So some of the stuff that's going on with Cable Labs with um, more of a, a coherent way to approach authentication cross-platform, I think that stuff is very good. I'm also looking a lot about now the new hybrid set-tops that have um, an OCAP stack, but then also have eBIF you know, as an application on top of it. So then you start to get into something that's a lot more interesting when a set-top also has a DOCSIS channel and you can um, do different kinds of things. As you know, a premium provider, we don't want anybody's PII, right? We don't want anybody's personal information that belongs to the affiliate. But we would love, like Margaret was talking about, to be able to say, oh, that house watches comedy, so let's have the Star's ch comedy channel or let's have some comedy options come up to them first as opposed to you know, let's just give them what we have on at 8 o'clock. Right. So, I mean, that I, that's how I want to yeah. see, when you talk about the future, whatever we can do to get the user or the viewer closer to the content, that's how we want to use advanced platforms, no matter what platform. So right. the game console, Trojan Horse, right? Would love to develop for that, right? Would love to. We look at that. We look at what we're going to, the next play in broadband. We're looking at what we're going to do on a tablet. I mean, we need to go where the consumers are. But we also have to DRM everything and make sure that we're, you know, we do the best we can for the viewer. Right. I mean, I think as echoing back to what Gavin was saying, we have to make sure that we keep the consumer's information protected and secure, and we need to make sure that we keep the content protected and secure as well. And I think that's the sort of the tricky part. Now, I have a, a, a question that I'm going to ask everybody. I'm going to ask them to be futurists for a moment and sort of imagine out what sorts of experiences, again, that they see coming. But we have a little bit of time. Does anybody have any questions? Sort of before the designers, it's okay if you know, because I got plenty. Oh, there's a gentleman right back there. Yeah, you. Just yell. Oh no, I totally. Uh, so wait, hold on. So, so the question, so for the folks over here, so it's about standardization. So, what what do the designers so, here feel about standardization? So with eBIF, right? Um, we were at the Cable Labs Interop a couple of weeks ago. We had six user agents. The app looked great on like five of them, and trust me, it's. I had three iterations of the app at this point, right? But now that we have new branding, it loads faster, la la la. But bottom line. One of, the, one of the user agents did something weird with transparency, so it looks like crap, right? So the other ones, they didn't do that, it looks great. So I would love to see them all have a standard around the standard, not the implementation that goes there. So the fact that now OCAP is trying not to, um, everybody knows what OCAP is, right? It's a standard for advanced set-top boxes that the consumer name is true two-way, but the actual, you know, spec is OCAP. So um, that one, there's a reference implementation, right? Because I think there's seven different implementations of, of, of true two-way now. What? Right, do this again? I mean, seriously. So uh, the VOD inter integration, I just, Channing knows it, tell it like it is, but the, you know, it's the VOD integration, we're begging. Okay, for two years we're begging to get people to have a similar VOD integration so that we can do this handoff that 
that works with one user agent that doesn't. You know, I'd love to see the standards around single sign-on, you know, some of the other things that are going on to the point of the back end, bring it. I mean, I, I think it's really important. So, Margaret, what do you think? Uh, just, I don't want people to have to design for TiVo. I want them designing for TV or designing for the, uh, the device, and I just want to be able to connect to that. Hmm. Um, and that's what's going to give us the variety of app choices. So standards are great that way. You know, standards, you know, you have to have them. I mean, it, that's all there is to it. I just want to make sure that the people making the standards are always looking at what's new because those standards have to adapt constantly. I mean, we're just learning so much, especially with tablets and those sort of devices right now. What are people doing on those things? How are they using them? Well, the standards can't be formed yet about advertising on tablets yet. It's not time yet. But, you know, it's coming very shortly. So we're almost out of time. And so what I want to ask is, as you begin to look out five years, six years, to this, these multiple screens, I'm going to ask you to be a futurist, but you don't have to actually predict. What I would ask you is, what would you like to see? So in the next five to six years, so a little bit further out, as you're creating these experiences and designing these experiences, primarily around television, but then also as it begins to move out, what, what would you like to see coming? So coming back to TV still being a shared experience in many ways, I would like to see that shared experience. You don't necessarily have to be in the same room, right? So you have the content in the cloud, you have people in different locations, whether it's on the, whatever platform you're on, the ability to have that connected experience of we are watching the same thing together, but we aren't necessarily in the same place. I think that's something it would be very interesting that we could do over the next five years or so. Kevin? Um, I, uh, do we? Go yeah. ahead. Well, my, we'll, have, my, we'll have the bald guy talk. <laughs> Well, that'd be both of us. So at any rate, is a, I'm, I'm, I feel a victim of devices right now. I feel like my devices, I work for them. They don't work for me. So I'm hoping in the next five years that I'll have a device that recognizes all my other devices and my devices start working for me. You know, I'm really kind of sick of responding to pings and dings and, you know, all the different things that my devices do. And, you know, I want to be able to tell my devices, okay, put my mail over there, put my entertainment over here, you know, and just really be able to easily organize my life of content. Uh, I'm going to quote my favorite futurist, Dan Quayle. I'm not sure if you remember. His quote is, the future will be better tomorrow. <laughs> and I sincerely believe that. Uh, uh, Gavin, I thought I was your favorite futurist. <laughs> <laughs> you are now. Uh, no, I think uh, what I see is uh, more of a seamless experience, and it's where the, the screens kind of go away, and we stop thinking about screens, and we start thinking of where we're interacting more directly with content. Uh, and these challenges around the experience, is anyone from Apple? Again, ding, iTunes. I hate iTunes. I cannot stand getting ac access to my content and managing and syncing. All of that crap has to just go away, you know. And and it should be something that I have direct access to at all times. I paid for it. It's mine. Let me see it on any device, any time, wherever I am, regardless of what I'm doing. So that's my hope for the future. Um, I want a flying plane. I want a flying car. There it is. Never. <laughs> I want a flying car. Really? In, um, here in San Francisco? Or you, you know what 101 would look like if there were flying cars? <laughs> no, I, what I said earlier, I, the, the personalization, recommendations, knowing what your friends are watching, having your content with you if that's what you want. I mean, um, I, I really think that the convergence is really going to work for the viewer in the long term. They'll have more options, right? They won't be able to just... And they don't today. Um, for 10 years ago, did we really perceive what was going to be going on now? Not, not to the level that it is. So I would say um, um, the convergence part of it is really what excites me. And that I could be able to do different things in different places. I'm not just you know, hooked to the television. Although I love the television. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And anybody who launches a service, I'm sorry, that doesn't do channel up and channel down, that's a non-starter. So, you know, to me. No, and that's clear. I mean, a lot of the, the work that we do and a lot of the <clears throat> future casting that I do is based on social science. And we study 
consumers all the time. And the, the fact of the matter is people love TV, and TV's not going to go anywhere, but it's certainly going to begin to migrate. And that experience of television, not just watching of TV, but interacting with the brands, interacting with all these different um, um, pieces of content, but also using television as a way to interact with your friends and family. We've all done that for years, and it's a very, very powerful, uh, powerful medium, certainly. Well, again, as, as I want to sort of thank all of my, uh, all of my panelists, um, we are going to um, probably hang out here a little bit as we walk off, because I know we're going to go into a break, so if you have more questions for them, please come. As we said, um, I'm going to be signing copies of Screen Future, my book, if you guys didn't get a copy of it or you want to have a quick chat. Um, and I just want to say thank you very much. Thank you.